Um, tonight, so I'm going to have you guys use the microphones because uh, and kind of just share them. Um, I'm going to be the loud mouth over here. So um, with that being said, this I like to build out the speakers and the, the topics based on basically what's what I feel is going on in the room. Um, based on kind of where there's some demand, some needs, uh, what people are experiencing, you know, kind of suffering through. So everyone is talking about the changing interest rates. Um, who here has been impacted by the changing interest rates? Um, it's like a, who feels personally violated by the, like, the, the feds? Okay, so with that being said, tonight I really wanted to bring in a panel. So let's talk about how there were originally five lenders on this panel. Due to unforeseeable events, two of them could not um, be with us tonight. So now we have the, the three, still a jam-packed um, panel here. So I'm going to do my job and pull as much uh, gems out, out of them, okay? And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to have them, I have a series of questions they're prepared with that I'm going to have them answer, and then we can incorporate some Q&A in. You guys kind of on board with what that's going to look like? You guys good? You guys ready for this? Because the interest rates is going to absolutely change a lot of things, especially your buying power, your buyer's ability, your buyer pool, right? Your uh, buyer's ability to close. So all of these things, wholesalers, this is going to uh, impact your buyer's list, right? Any wholesalers in here seeing that? I can tell you right now, uh, I I'm seeing that across the board for a lot of wholesalers. Their buyer's list are drying up quickly. So we want to go ahead and give you guys as much with this. So let's start off here. Robert, let's start with you. Can you introduce yourself and then uh, tell us you know, who you are, a little bit of your backstory, uh, and then who you're with and kind of what you all have to offer. All right. Thank you, Courtney. Uh, my name is Robert Bellman. I'm with Heritage Bank. Heritage Bank is a small, I like to say mom and pop local bank, truly like Mayberry RFD type of bank. Like if you call, they answer the phone. You don't press one, you don't press two. We've got four locations, and we do all these, you know, conventional loans already. We can do all that stuff, but my niche really is I do a lot of portfolio loans. And these are loans that we make that we don't sell because they don't meet the requirements to do like a conventional type of loan. Um, the good thing is it's not cookie cutter. The bad thing is it's not cookie cutter. So when you call me, hey, what about this, what about that, I'm going to say, hey, I need to see things. And if I put a little package together, I can bring it to my underwriter and say, do you want to present this to the board? And a lot of times we can do things that a lot of people can't. Um, I've been doing this for a while. I mean, I started off with a finance company. Mortgage rates, don't get mad at me, but our mortgage rates are like 14, 15%. Um, and I was just looking at the history of rates. I think they started tracking this in the 70s. And I think the average rate from like 71 to now is like seven and a quarter or seven, six, something like that. So. Even though we don't like the sevens, it is an average rate over the time that we've been doing business. We've just been spoiled with the twos and threes and you know everyone else is spoiled with that and not prepared for it either. Unfortunately, right. I think it's going to go up even more before the end of the year. I mean, well, I think, hey, we'll get you into that in a second. <laughs> You're jumping ahead here. Um, um, but I but do, we, I do I, that is a part of what I want to pick apart tonight. So your background is in various forms of finance. Correct. Um, and then Heritage Bank is a small bank. Um, so I use Heritage Bank, so, so full disclosure, it's where I keep um, my, my holding companies. And um, uh, they are small. Like I walk in, they're like, hey, Courtney, like relationship banking is still there, right? Um, and so uh, portfolio loans is not as common at banks. Um, anyone here ever used a portfolio loan before? Some of, anyone? One, one person? Okay. The, the reason why a portfolio loan is really special, you talk about them not selling it, is it allows them to be a little bit more creative with their borrowing um, criteria. Would you say that's right. true? Yep. Um, versus he talked about that cookie cutter. And so one of the things that's really important is, um, the, other, the other part to that, is there any limit with portfolio loans for an individual? We don't really, it's, you know, because I said it's not cookie, it's a case by case. We're looking at everyone as an individual. So, you may come to me with a product, and this person may come to me with a product, but we look at the person, you know, not just the product. So what might be a good deal for him might not be a good deal for her because of their background. We don't look at, we look at credit score, but when I say redeeming qualities, what do most banks look at? They look at credit score, they look at loan to value, they look at debt to income. 
Well, if we can get two out of three to be good, we're going to try and make it work. So it really depends on the individual coming to us. The property could be great, and maybe you only have one out of those two things we're looking at to be good. So it's really, we want to find some kind of redeeming quality to try and make it work. So I don't want to say we have a limit. We may limit a particular person, but that doesn't mean everyone's limited. So that like conventional, 10 conventional loan products, is, does that apply here? Or no. You said that depends. No, it just depends on the individual. It's good to know. So this is the reason why this is important. Most banks don't have portfolio loan products. So this is something you buy and hold guys, you people who like to do the Burr method, you know, things, this is a, a product that you want to say, hey, let me at least um, be, be open to saying, hey, what is this all about? Um, awesome, Robert. All right, so we're going to go ahead. Um, you got your own. Oh. There you go. Um, my name's Anitra Preston. I'm with Vertical <coughs> Capital. Um, my background is in real estate investing. Um, I started investing back in 2004, uh, so pretty much this change in this market that we're getting ready to go into, that's where my market was when I first started, so I'm uh, not scared at all of that. Um, Elridge and I, my partner right there, he's my, he's my business partner, we're, we're actually smaller than Heritage Bank. Uh, <laughs> we're going to pick up the phone, we're the underwriters, we're the marketers, we're everything. Uh, our our products are basically asset based. Uh, we look more at the deal um, than we do. We don't check credit scores. Um, I'm not asking you for uh, your last W-2s and check statements and things of that nature. Uh, we specialize in short-term loans, um, bridge funding. Uh, so to speak, you probably heard that term before. Uh, our products are generally six six months, but we are stretching it. Um, we have a 12 month loan as well uh, for new construction. Uh, so we're not sitting here checking a lot of boxes, right? So everybody's business doesn't fit that box. So Elders and I try our best to, to try, you know, we're not gonna make it work. If it doesn't work, it just doesn't work. But we are gonna try to work with you uh, to see if we can make that loan for you. Uh, we can close uh, really quickly. Generally, when the title is clear, we're ready to close, provided that you're able to provide the documents that we request, which is just simply like insurance and, and little and inspections um, that we do require on, on some property, not all the property, but most of the time we, we would require an inspection. I don't know, I kind of went off on the tangent. No, no, so you're good. So so we've got, so they, they're a local hard money lender company that does okay. Um, bridge loan, so so six. You said the twelve month is the new construction loan. Yeah, the twelve month is the new construction loan. Um, yeah, and you said with hard money. I don't like that term. Oh, my like, bad, my bad, my bad, my bad. <laughs> no, because it's just kind of stuff. So basically, um, we're a little bit different than what I like to call other hard money loan lenders are like Lima One, Temple View, RNC Capital. Our our capital is straight from private investors. Um, so we have the full autonomy to make decisions and to make decisions quickly. So that's what I said when we're not checking boxes, but we're kind of like a hybrid, so to speak. Okay. You know? Good stuff. Look, my bad, my bad. No, Look, just full disclosure. Bad. I'm just playing. Full, no, no, no. Full <laughs> disclosure. Um, full disclosure. I'm going to be real honest. When um, I don't, a lot of you guys know a lot of my history with between even my rental properties, things like that, I predominantly used who our next guest is going to talk about. Um, I'm, I've used these strategies. The only bank loan I've ever uh, used was a line of credit, a home equity line of credit. And I used it on, on my second to f my, my second, third, and fourth deal. And uh, I haven't used the bank since. But I have an understanding of this because I have bought deals subject to the existing loan and it was a, uh, a bank loan. So I understood the concept. My mother's been a lender for 30 years, so, you know, I've heard some concepts and, you know, I obviously understand in the industry to a degree um, the concept of them, but I I feel so, hi, nice to meet you guys, right? I've gone to Robert a few times, I'm like, hey, maybe, you know, and, and uh, because I'm so used to doing either um, loans from some people in my sphere or creative financing. So with that being said, you want to introduce yourself? Um. So I'm Adam Johnson. I'm starting to notice a pattern that I'm usually the oddball on the panels. <laughs> so we're talking about creative lending tonight, and I can go ahead and just burst your bubble. I don't lend money. Um, but 
what I do is I create lenders with sellers, right? And that's that's what my niche has been. So I actually use. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Um, I, I actually went through when I got started back in O2. I grew up around a lot of this stuff. Actually, October 11th was. It's okay, October I'll keep reminding you. It's, it's a new commodity in the room, so it's okay. Keep my going. 20 year anniversary from First Investment House. Um, seen an incredible amount of stuff, not nearly as much as some of the folks like Mr. Sanji, wherever he went he to. Did he leave? Yeah. Man, he's got it down. Come in and make an appearance. And, <laughs> um, no, he's usually out there in the hall talking <laughs> with someone. I've caught on to his group. Um, but so in the beginning, Right, I didn't really need banks. We had some of our own private funding. And then I, like most young men do, right, I went off to blaze my own trail. And I developed a relationship with a banker who understood creative, right, different than the traditional stuff that we hear about. And he and I did a lot of deals together. In fact, I cannot bank with him anymore because he and I do deals together. Um, and so we had to move me away from his bank. Um, so you actually started doing real estate deals with your banker and they're like, we accept, we appreciate your business, but uh, that's a conflict of interest because you guys are making money together, not just lending you money. And he's turning, I mean, he's become a really good friend, he a fellow Douglas. investor. Absolutely. Um, and so I, like one thing that I want to point out, right? Like we're all talking about drastically different programs, products, whatever you want to call it. There's not one that's necessarily right and the others are wrong. Some of it is what's right for you right now. And some of it, like most things in life, it's a combination of all of them, right? So the only reason that I don't use banks anymore is because in 2012, 2012, 2013, I lost everything I had, right? I was young, I was really, really smart, so much smarter back then than I am now. Um, and I, I just, I had a few wrong decisions. I got a divorce and one bad business deal in a year and went from the Midas touch to literally losing houses and watching them drag my car away. It was a really interesting wake up call. But after that, right, my buddy at the bank was my friend, but he couldn't be my banker anymore. Um, and so I had to figure out some alternatives and along the way, now I, I use it as a challenge. Like, can I get this done without a bank? Um, not to diminish your guys' value because I've done a lot of deals with banks and lenders, some short term, some long term. Um, but that situation really forced me into some alternative options. Um, and what I found for my loans is either private money or we create our lenders from our sellers. Okay. So that's, uh, let's go ahead. So now you have an idea who, who we have here. Um, let's go ahead and talk about this. The last two years have been a wild, wild ride in real estate. I mean, we were seeing, um, what's the lowest rate someone saw personally? Anyone want to share? Like maybe it doesn't have to be your loan. It could be like, you know, your, your, your mother got the loan or whatever. Two point something. Two point something. Two point eight. Do you, do you recall? I'd say two, two, two percent. Two percent. The lowest I saw on paper was 1.75 and I was like. Yeah, my jaw was dropped too. Yeah, 1.75%. I'm like, um, here's my card. Keep me in mind. <laughs> you ever go to move? Can I? Can we have a conversation first? Um, anyway, so wild, wild year, right? Record, record sales, uh, record competition, record uh, low loans, right? We saw, uh, Robert was talking about how we were spoiled with how low the loans were. Super wild ride. Moratoriums of COVID, all these different things. So the question is. Can you each go through and share what the last two years have looked like for you? Um, whether it's been, um, you know, what were some of the things that you saw? Because so we want to talk a little bit about the height of where we've been from, and then I'm going to follow that up with um, what are you seeing right now with the crazy interest rate that. So let's first start with what have you seen the last two years? Well, the two percent times were great. I didn't see much because I never left my office. Okay, so you never left your office. Um, never left your office because there was such record high refinances right. and, and purchases. And purchases. Yeah. Like to the point that that banks and lending companies, mortgage companies, were rapidly 
increasing their um, hiring opportunities because they just had so much business they needed more help. Would you, you know, say that's true? I don't, you know, we didn't increase too many employees. We really okay. didn't. We were just busier. Okay. You know, the other thing I saw, though, and I don't want to go negative, but the other thing I saw is I saw a lot of people overpay. Yeah. Overpay for properties. You know, the What's house the reality? So it's, it's the reality of what we saw. The market. Yeah. The market. Right. The house appraised for 400000 The seller wants four fifteen. The buyer pays four fifteen. They come to the table with the difference. Surprisingly, there was some cash there, which is something about the last two years. There was a lot of cash out there right. sitting on the sidelines. And so then people started using them to get deals done that were harder to do. What concerns me is what's going to happen in the next two to three years. We're getting there. Okay. Yes, so yes. No, 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 you're good. Mm -hmm. And look, I'm That's loving twice this. I'm jumping ahead of you. No, so. no, you're all good. And I'm the over caffeinated You're not one. jumping, you're leading. Okay, leading. He said leading. So much better. No, no, look, and that's what I love. So, Robert has been an ally of mine for years now, someone who is a fantastic um, resource in this, in this industry. So, you're seeing that, you're seeing the, the re refinances. Look, my, my own, um, you know, I saw a lot of people in my life who were refinancing, like to save money on their monthly note. Some crazy savings were happening. So that pit money in people's pockets, right? I actually had a, re, uh, a gentleman refinance his house, took a little cash out, and then I want to say maybe seven months later, refinanced it again. Oh, wow. For the, for the lower rate and the lower term. And you, I was like, dude. A, a refi cost about, what, a few thousand dollars? Yeah, but he, he made up for it. He made up for it. He did well. Yeah. He, isn't that great? And then the probably the appreciation in that time period too. Yeah, he did. He did okay. So back in 07, 08, So so this is I got in the industry in twenty fourteen. I've never been in a you know changing, falling, shifting market. So I'm a huge student of past shifting and changed markets. And that was one of the things they said of 07, 08, uh, Well, o, o, o 05, 06, 07, The the ramp up to 08 was that bless you. There was so much speculation in the market. Um, flippers would buy houses and they'd make their profit without rehabbing, just waiting and selling. Yeah. Right? So, so that speculation, what we saw is this crazy amount of speculation where the appreciation was there. And so people got to double dip into refinances in the same year. That's freaking crazy. All right. <laughs> so, so for us, it's a, it's a little bit different view, right? Um, we're not on that traditional side. So as rates, uh, I guess as we, we get the cooling off of the market, if you want to, if you want to say, it doesn't necessarily uh, affect us. Um, what I have seen though is when you look at like those larger companies like Temple View or Lima One Capital, whose capital is tied to what we call Wall Street money or hedge funds and stuff like that. What what I have noticed because I actually saw a quote from Temple View, uh, they're meeting us. They're meeting our rates, you know, the rates that Elwidge and I, Vertical Capital use, hard money uses. Those rates are now going to be met, right? Uh, I've seen quotes at 12% at where versus those guys used to be at the 5%. Um, for us, uh, we have zero defaults right now. Thank, thank God that we have zero defaults. We are seeing where fix and flippers were getting in and out of their property at about three to four months, um, they're now pushing the limits to the, to the long term. So, uh, but with us, we, we try to work with our borrowers, right? If I see you're 30, 45 days out, I'm going to give you a call and say, hey, Nehemiah, how's it going? Is there something I can help you out with? I try to get ahead of that. Um, I am paying attention to what you're listing your property at. Um, now I'm not in your business, you know, and telling you, hey, I think you're a little bit high, because I'm also a real estate agent as well. But I am paying attention to where some of my, uh, my fix and flippers, they started off at a certain price, uh, and now they are now reducing their prices uh, as they get closer to, to their long terms. So the last two years, what were you seeing with those flippers? Were you seeing, like talk to me about you know, their sales price and their days on market. What were you seeing from your from your side as the lender, were you getting paid off earlier? Were you yeah, I mean, our average sales cycle was what? Less than 160 days. So um, it was it was real good for us because I'm I'm looking at the velocity of it, right? So I'm, I'm in on a loan yeah. um, 90 to 100 days later. I'm, I fund that loan 100 days earlier. Now 100 days later, I'm out of that loan again and now I get to use that money again. Um, and some of my fix and flippers, they come to us two and three times. 
you know, where they're now trying, you know, at that particular time they were, they were being approved or moving forward with two and three properties at a time. Well now, uh, within the last month or two, I'm not seeing that same volume in, ap in applications. Um, as they're holding on to the properties a little bit longer, they want to be a little bit more conservative on making sure that they clear those loans out before moving on to the next application. So Adam, what did you see in the last two years um, in the, 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 the private money, the creative financing side? So again, being the oddball, um, like my perspective, right, it was a heyday. The last several years, if you guys somehow missed it, was an absolute heyday of craziness and excitement, right? I mean, everybody was scrambling to grab whatever they could, and we got a lot of competition, right? And so from the creative side, I mean, a lot of those opportunities just they weren't there anymore, right? Or they it really had to be some more special circumstances, typically with some urgent deadlines, right? They're coming up for foreclosure. They don't have time to slap it on the market for three weeks, right? Because everybody knew 12 months ago, you could get in a bind, and as long as you had 30 days to put it on the market at a fairly reasonable price, <laughs> we're going to get several offers to choose from, right? So, I hope this doesn't come across bad. I'm gonna seem like a sick and twisted human being. Um, I've been really, it's been exciting and it's been fun, but it's been boring as hell. And I don't know any other way to say that. So like, my, my excitement is coming because the market is changing, right? So you're talking about the last two years, would it be safe to assume it's because it wasn't a lot of skill involved? Everybody's a great investor when the time is good, right? Everybody's a great investor. I, thought, I was leading you there. Yeah, like everybody can do it and twist it. when in three twist it. months from now, you can sell it for more money, right? Like there's a lot of smart people that can do that in good times, right? But now, like there's actually like you've really got to get in and know how to, to navigate a lot of what's happening. Um, and that's the, how many of y'all have heard, right, much less said, if there's blood in the streets, it's time to, uh, did that, yeah, surely that made it to Louisiana. <laughs> I know Bob got it. <laughs> when there's blood in the streets, it's time to buy. Have y'all not, raise your hand if you have not ever heard that. Okay. All right, so the guy who said it, his name is Warren Buff. No, oh, J.P. Morgan. Oh, J.P. Morgan, that's What's right. Uh, Buffett, Warren Buffett was quoting J.P. Morgan um, back in the day when he said, um, so if you guys follow me on Instagram, I shared that actually like within the last two, three weeks, where it's when there's blood, actually I need to go see what it says, the full quote, but it's like when there's blood in the street, <laughs> by, but when, it, no, it's the idea of when everyone um, is being greedy, be fearful. be fearful when everyone is being fearful. Be greedy. Thank you. Did someone pull that up? That was the full quote. Um, but do you That's see that? That's the Warren Buffett one. That's the Warren Buffett one. But it's the idea there of when everyone is greedy. So that speculation. That's a very common ramp up to a changing market. Is speculation. It's uh, for example when I heard the airline stewardess was saying, "Oh, I'm thinking of flipping some houses um, in my downtime in between, you know, Denver and Dallas." You know. Um, and so when I was flying here and that, I'm like, and I'm reading about 1929, the crash of 1929, and how all the rampant speculation in the streets, I'm like, that sounds like speculation. <laughs> so then the reality there is, it's a lot of us the last two years have been, deals have been harder to do, right? Um, and yes, there were some great interest rates, but at the same time, you're, you had higher price points. Right. And I think I think that's the thing. And I don't mean to say that bad. Right. Because it's like it's not to make light that there's a lot of tough times coming. Right. Like there's people going through it already. We're having totally different conversations with sellers. I'm sure like y'all are seeing some different conversations with people you've lent to. Um, but I'm, I'm actually more excited about the opportunities over the next 24 months than I was about the last 24 months. Um, so 
and I think that's where everyone has a different, lot different things going on in the marketplace, right? Um, so the last 24 months were so wild. Some people got really excited locking in some really low rates. Um, having been someone that I personally don't use banks, I'm excited because now I get to go buy those properties subject to, right? Um, and a, a big part of that is knowing that the last, the last two years were really exciting times. They were, I was wanting to see, you need some uh, water too? Yeah, we need some water. All right, there you go, thank you, there you go. So ultimately here, one of the biggest things is the last two years, for some it was really great. For some, it was you got great long-term debt um, that you're excited about. You locked it in for your portfolio. Um, maybe for like me, I sold some of my rental properties the last two years. That was great. I got some stellar high uh, price, top of the market prices, right? Um, so let's talk through, but here's the thing is, um, as someone who predominantly buys a lot with creative financing, a lot of times with sellers, as someone who considers myself a helper, not a haggler, I tell the seller, I'm like, look, you could sell to me, and yeah, you could sell to me on creative financing, um, but I, the, the reality is, is you could also go list it on the market, you know, and it be somewhat competitive. Now, there's, there was definitely a lot of times, though, I still bought because there were still people who had a problem that needed to be solved with the skill set like I have, that a lot of you guys have, right? So we did still do some deals the last few years. In the last two years, how many of you guys did deal real estate investment deals that you guys were proud of? Right? So a lot of people in this room, 75% of the room just raised their hand. So it wasn't that there weren't deals, they were just harder to come by because sellers knew their options. They could put it on the market. They could, you know, uh, like the guy who refinanced within a few months, a seller could say, hey, well, if I have time, some of my best deals came from people who didn't have time, who had a, a, a ton of motivation, right? So let's talk about, now we can kind of dive a little bit further in, what are you currently seeing right now? Let's go ahead and start back with Robert. Uh, let's go back into where I'm going to lead you back into what are you seeing right now? And then, um, yeah, what are you seeing right now? Are you seeing people line up to get refinances, I'm mortgage actually, applications? I'm seeing a lot of HELOCs. I'm seeing a lot of people that are trying to access the equity in their home because okay. they don't want to refinance and ruin the rate that they have. <clears throat> so okay. I'm getting a little, What's that? Did you apply with me? Shots fired. Did you, did you, wait, did you apply with me? Did, oh, well, that's completely different. Then. <laughs> if you would call me, it would have been different. That's funny. Tell me the story. I'm not afraid. Um, no, so, okay, so that's very interesting. So that's one of those things. People are saying, hey, I want to access that capital. Are they, are they accessing it for investments? Are they accessing it for repairs on their homes? Actually, the most recent call was an investor. He's, he's looking to buy something. He said it just needs a little work. He said, well, if the numbers work, if the numbers work, we'll certainly take a look at it. The challenge with HELOCs, though, if, if our bank doesn't have your first mortgage, the maximum we're probably going to go up to is 50000 which doesn't do a lot of good. If, uh -huh. we, if you don't have a first, then we might go up to 100000 maybe a little more. Yeah. But it's situational case by case. But depending on where the equity falls, you know, 50000 if you got a first, I don't know your story, maybe we could have done it if you called me, or He says my card's over here. Yeah, it's right there. No, actually, there was an employment with my husband because he's been in this job like for only, I think, two months. And sure. That's so that's there's the going to be some cases. Yeah. Well, and that's with any yeah. loan. Yeah, that's, that's with a lot, a lot yeah. of loans. Yeah. So, okay, so um, that is something I'm seeing. People are saying, okay. Maybe there's going to be opportunity around or, or things are going to change lending wise. Let me see what I can lock in right now. A line of credit is a generally a 10 year term. Yeah. That, that line of credit is open for 10 years. So maybe they're saying, hey, let me access this right now on today's valuation. Track with me. Let's just say it's a 300,000, it's worth 300, let's you $300,000. Maybe they owe, you know, 200 on it. And so, you know, whether they go up on the home equity line of credit 70, 75% loan to value, you know, whatever that would be, someone will quick do 75% of 300,000. 225? Yeah, that's, that's chump change. Maybe I should have done a lower loan. That was off the top of my head. Um, but the idea is maybe they say, well, let me, you know, can I access that 25? Is it worth going through all the paperwork to access that? Um, I started my second, third, and fourth deal on a $60,000 line of credit. And that was really how I, I started to really get into um, some, some of my deals. And so 
But that was something where one of the things I've heard is that during changing markets, lines of credit become very difficult or they, they tighten. Can you speak on that? Well, they, do, they definitely do look at it a little harder. They do definitely to tighten it up a little bit. Um, in our portfolio, it's, it's, I'm, it's, I'm never going to say it's easy, but they do, it's really what's your DTI. You, you know, most of the time when someone comes to me, there's three challenges, right? There's the loan to value, there's the debt to income, and then can you prove your income, you know? And then you don't have to prove all your income. I mean, I, I've seen us go up to like 50% debt to income. Um, you got to prove something. You can't come in making no money. I mean, unless you're going to put $2 million in our bank, maybe we'll help you. That was but, 07. <laughs> oh, that was 07, yeah. If you could fog a mirror. Those are, yeah, those are really good days. Um, but no, so, so they do tighten up a little bit. I, I mean, I'll tell you, I don't know too many other banks that are doing HELOCs right now. Yeah, I do know that that is one of the number one things I heard as far as commercial and residential lines of credit. But again, that's literally my only bank product apart from buying property subject to those loans has been the home equity line of credit. This is the only time I can really say, oh, I can peep, pipe in here, right? Uh, but the reality is, is that is something that, um, you know, various partners of mine and stuff have talked, people who are on properties with or who've been investing for a while, they said, yeah, my commercial line of credit you know, one day I had a hundred grand on it and then, you know, the market started changing and they, uh, you know, the banker called and said, hey, you know, we're, we're actually putting a hold on your ability to draw on it right now. And so those are some things you say, hey, it could be a great opportunity, which is why a lot of people right now lo locking those in and having access to it, but then understand that at some point, sometimes um, that is something that they tighten on. Maybe it's, they used to be a little bit more freer with the, the line of credit. So that is something you want to kind of keep in mind. Uh, Anitra, what is something you go ahead. I, I just want to make one point about something that I've, <clears throat> so when you have a good lender, like how many of y'all think that you may need a loan in the next 12 months? Okay. For the people want to buy, right? Yeah. Come talk to your people before you think you need one, yeah. right? It's so important. Yeah. Same as what there's a, there's a problem communicate that like we, we're so tr just ingrained with this idea that we're negotiating against the banker right like we sit down at the desk and they're on the, the comfortable chair side and we're on this wooden arm chair side we're sitting straight up and they look really relaxed and we're just waiting nail biting are they going to say yes are they going to say yes and maybe this mysterious loan committee had a you know change of heart and they're going to write us a check and the truth of it is, is a really good banker wants you to do well. They want you to make money and they want you to come back and they want to keep you protected. Once you find the good ones, communicate with them way early on. And you, he's right. The more information we have, the better, the better we can make it. When I go to my underwriter, she's going to start asking me questions like, I don't know. I don't know. She's like, yeah, you'll find that out. So the more things we get from you, the better it is or easy it is for us to make a decision. Absolutely. And to piggyback off of what both of them are saying, the, the approach, right? Don't try to approach your lender, any lender, with more of a relationship mindset mm -hmm. than a transactional. <laughs> than a transactional you mindset. I think right if now. you have the relationship mindset, that softens your ability to be able to, like they say, is to communicate uh, on the, especially up front, you know, being, being open and honest as to where you are, where you are economically, you know, uh, just a few different things like that. Um, Elridge and I, we really push to have relationships. I, I'd, I'd love to do 10 deals with, with a few people then they have to go out here and, and do 100 deals with 100 different people. It's just a yeah. lot of work, right? Uh, you'll find that most bankers or most lenders are open to your approach as more a relation, more of a relationship than just a, a transaction, you know? Well, it's, like as buyers, sorry, that's well, and I'll stop talking, you. but think, how, how many of y'all are going to go on an appointment in the next month to go for look at a house? Don't be scared. Raise your hands. Yeah. Okay. There you go. What do you want the seller to do? Do you want them to pit against you and go back and forth and haggle? Or would you rather you go in and say, hey, I might be able to help you. Tell me what you need. And they lay all the cards out on the table so y'all can figure it out together. 
Same exact thing. Right. Same exact thing. So on that side, what I'm seeing right now. I don't get commission for this either. Yeah. Way. So so <laughs> what what you're seeing right now, what Adam, what are you seeing with sellers right now in in regards to the loans you create with sellers or the deals you do with the existing types of loans with sellers? Um. Well, conversations with sellers have gotten drastically different in the last six weeks, probably. Um, we've been a lot, like where we used to be a lot more fluid with our conversations because like while we're talking to them and asking them hard questions, there's three people beeping in saying, we'd love to talk to you about buying your house. Um, that's kind of gone away a little bit. And so we've gotten a lot more firm and assertive uh, with our approach and we're really digging in for the motivation so it's kind of back to being right like the doctor role if if you don't have a problem then like you probably don't need me let me get you going in another direction right like, and, hey let me introduce this realtor yeah, yeah. yeah and I told somebody that the other day they were, they were asking me a lot of questions they said well just make me an offer and I said it's not really how it works right like that's like walking into the doctor's office and saying I'm not going to answer your questions just throw me out a diagnosis, right? Like, that's not what I do. It sounds like you might need, and this was the words I used, it sounds like you might need a doctor that does checkups. I'm the ER doctor that when there's a serious problem and we've got a short amount of time to do it and you need somebody that really can get the stuff done fast, that's me. It sounds like you just need a checkup, right? And so it's, and it's not so much pushing for a deal necessarily as much as it's pushing to see if there's a problem that I'm even meant to solve there. And it's that sorting process, but I've been able to get a lot more assertive in the last four to six weeks on pinning down, do you have a problem for me to solve? If not, go this way. If you do, then let's get all the pieces out on the table. And I've had more people be in, I mean, before you said terms and people were like, no. <coughs> and now, like I say, look, I, ha I have a cash option. It may not be your best option. I have a few other ideas that might work that I've used in other situations similar to yours. I'm happy to go through some of that with you. And the number of people that are saying, I, I would love to hear whatever you have to offer has, I mean, we're triple, quadruple digit growth. I kind of use the same thing when someone calls me and says, what's my rate? said, so, you know, like an auto mechanic, I can't tell you what's wrong with your car until I look under the hood. And, you know, just because rates are advertised on TV or whatever they may be at that day, doesn't mean everyone gets that rate. There are hits to what's going on with your personal finances that's going to cause your rate to fluctuate one way or the other. So it's really, without seeing the whole story, I really, I can tell you what you want to hear. That doesn't mean it's the rate you're going to get. My so, buddy used to do that when people asked. He would tell them, like, somehow we're at 15%. And if they argued, he said, well, come on in, let's take a closer look at it. <laughs> so I could get in trouble for you. <laughs> you know, I, I had an agent once call me about her client. I don't want to get off topic, but she kept telling me what a great person he was and how good he was and how great he was. And I said, so you'll co-sign? Oh. And she said, well, I'm not going to do that. I, the agent never called me back. But, you know, he said it was so good, but she wouldn't co-sign. I didn't understand. Yeah, they don't understand. So one of the things I've been seeing, similar to Adam, is with sellers, um, right now they're, what it is is that they understand the market has changed, and they understand that interest rate, higher interest rate have lowered people's buying power. Do you guys understand what that looks like? Um, Adam, right. do you have a, you know what, I've got my... Unlike what my math teacher said, I have a calculator in my pocket all the time. <laughs> yeah, so um, there's something that I want to encourage you guys. You've heard me talk about it numerous times before. Uh, it's called a 10B2I calculator. It's a financial calculator. Um, the number 10, the, the letter B, and two small I's, the 10B2I um, calculator. It's like $5.99 on the App Store. I owned it for six months before I knew how to use it. This is one of my most common tools that I use when I do creative financing deals or when I create loans with private money lenders, that's for my sphere of influence. And basically it's a financing calculator. It's a little bit more um, complex than a normal calculator. Uh, but uh, his father, Mr. Leon Johnson, who's been investing since the seven, uh, 70s, it was one of the first things he said, Courtney, if you wanna be proficient in creative financing, you need to know how to use this. You play around on this, but you guys can go on bankrate.com if you don't want to use this. 
Go put in a two hundred thousand dollar property at three percent interest rate. Look what the the, the payments are. Eight forty three and twenty one cents. Okay. Now let's go ahead and do that one at uh, seven seven percent, which might be a little light today. Anybody have a guess? So wait, the last one. So who said that? Do we have a giveaway? Yes, we do. <laughs> Jeremy is using his. Oh, that. What's that? That's, that's, that's yeah, and that's before yeah. escrow. So that's thirteen before. thirty and sixty cents. If I knew that was going to be math, I would have brought my processor. <laughs> <laughs> you have the 12C. 12HP 12C. Yes, I, no, I, I have a system. Right. <laughs> okay. You're using your 10B2I calculator? Yeah. Oh, your head. Ooh, look at you. I had the old slide it out. All right, so, so the point here, what were the two numbers? You know, because I didn't hear them, actually. <laughs> so one was 800 and some change, and then bumping just the interest rate to 7 Put it at 1300 and change. So almost nearly doubled it. No, you know, ish. But that's not including taxes and insurance, which, let's face it, insurance is really high. But also, the tax assessor reassesses taxes in St. Timmy Parish every four years. The last assessment, assessment was 2020. So in, so in 2024, do you know what's coming for a lot of people? Higher taxes. We ain't there yet. So things like that will greatly impact people so their buying power right let's just say that 800 and some change plus their taxes and insurance puts them at 1100 you take that 1300 you take that now elevated insurance rate things like that they're now looking at 15 you know 1600 that greatly changes someone's ability to buy so what happens that two hundred thousand dollar purchase price has to get lowered 126 100 to, to keep the same, the same payment, payment 126 thousand dollars so to keep that same 800 and change payment for principal and interest, they go from being able to buy a $200,000 house to a $126,000 house. So, so, okay, but here's the thing is, different, different products are coming out with 0% interest rates more and more. Um, they have already rural development that's in our area, things like that. So let's talk about the next topic is how are you pivoting to still do business and help clients? Make sure you want to talk about that? Because these rising interest rates, so they don't imp impact you guys as much, but is there anything that you're saying, hey, let's do this to be a little bit more cautious or like, hey, let's look a little bit closer at this? The only thing I think, um, again, we, we're not really connected to that traditional space, right? So this is one thing you just got to remember. But I think what we have done is we are extending our loan, our loan terms where we would only primarily consider that six, that shorter term. We are being a little bit more um, flexible in, in understanding where you are in your repair process, the possibility of you sitting on the market a little bit longer. So we don't have set terms right now, but um, we would consider the longer terms, nine months, 12 months you know, um, possibly even 15 months we would, we would consider that. Um, we, we lend at 65% of ARV. Um, we made that adjustment in April um, to accommodate for the longer term and also the higher cost. Uh, and we hope, um, sometimes we do encourage our, our investors to kind of make offers. Um, you need to be starting to make offers lower than what you had been doing in the past so those are some of the adjustments that we've made yeah that's really smart I can tell you right and, now in, in lending too we we're, we're we've opened up the door to to lend in second lien position um, we do consider uh, cross collateralization uh, and things like that so getting a little bit more creative um, is where we are uh, going to be headed in uh, 2023 so, so give someone an example of what that second lien position like like do you have a scenario that that you could share with that? I don't. I don't have a. I don't have a scenario with it because we just introduced it. So, okay, so our, yeah. To, so if I were to get a sell, right. so so seller, I have one right now. Um, wants a hundred. You know, it was a hundred and twenty thousand dollar property. Um, she wants thirty five thousand, and um, and then she would do the rest on on seller financing long term. Right. So I'm like, that's pretty steep for me. But if I wanted to. I could come take a look at what that you know would look like, right? Exactly. And so, um, so where the predominantly seller financing loan would be a first position loan, and then the second position would be 
you know, maybe this this loan with them. Right. So, but yeah, it would be a short term loan. Right. <laughs> right. So <laughs> let let's let, let me throw out a um, an an idea. There is, um, well, let, let me let me continue the conversation with you guys. Actually, so what else are you guys p pivoting? You said you are extending your term period. I can tell you right now, if you are flipping and if you don't give yourself at least 12 months of a timeline, because look, let's just hope you sell it in six. But I have a property in Abita Springs that when I underwrote it, everything was you know one, three, and seven days on market. Um, I mean, it's only looking up right now. It's 3076 South Dundee Loop. And uh, I think it's you know, 30, 40 days on the market or something like that. Now it's under contract with the second buyer. The first one walked purely because they got scared. And so, um, I mean, I'll look up and see how many days on market is, but that is something I'm building in. If I choose to sell something right now, if I cannot handle 12 months of the utilities being on, the insurance, you know, maybe the cutting the grass, at the end of the day, you're looking at that, you're saying, hey, you're not giving payments, maybe there's interest only payments, maybe there's, you know, so selling right now is not, not moving as quickly as it used to, which is actually causing <clears throat> some investors to get in trouble. And that is also a falling value. So one of the biggest things we, we started earlier talking about is price reduction, price improvement, price decrease. That is a very, I mean, you scroll through my Facebook feed, that's all I feel like I'm seeing these days. So that is something. Did you have to reduce your um, selling price for your property? Yeah, we did. did. We did. So we went on the market. So again, we listed at 200000 We had it on the market. Um, can someone pull up one red friend? It's 3076. Dundee Loop South and Abita Springs. Look on Redfin. See how many days on market. So we initially. Fifty-nine. How many? Fifty-nine. Fifty-nine days on market. I knew it was something like that. So fifty-nine days on market. Every single comp we had was under seven days on the market or less when I bought this property. So the reality here, we listed at two hundred thousand. There were some that went a little bit over the two hundred. So like we were being safe and keeping it at that two hundred. And the reality is, is that we went through one buyer who just got scared when the rates changed. I used to have, one buyer was enough usually. Now we're actually having to go through that second one. Um, and the reality here is, so we, we put it back on the market after the first one, it did not, I mean, dried up. So we then dropped it $2,500 from there and then it, got, <laughs> then it went back under market again. Thankfully, it was only how to drop 25. Now don't get me wrong, we have some concessions we gave up on, so we'll see if before Thanksgiving this one closes, but the reality here is, if you underwrote your numbers at, truly 215 is probably where I could have aggressively listed it at, but we listed at 200. I think if we can get out at 183, 185, you know, give or take, I think that we're gonna be good. But what if you ran your numbers at 215 and then you're settling at 185? Are you giving yourself that much margin? On top of that, any of you guys who flip properties, you know every three months what comes due your vacancy insurance policy, right? If you do a three month premium. So one of those things are, those are not cheap. So the longer you hold your utilities, your insurance bills. So be very cautious here. Be very cautious here because yesterday's price is not today's price. And what a lot of people are learning is that yesterday when they underwrote on yesterday's number, they're now stuck holding the bag. So then how can you pivot? So to follow up with that, how are you pivoting with your with your clients, uh, Robert? If you want to answer that, or well, I mean, we're doing a lot of helix, like I said, to help them with that. But we're also we probably can, depending on the situation, the individual, we can go up a little bit on the DTI, the debt to income. Okay, so adjusting more terms, being creative with that, Adam. What is something else? I think. How are you doing more <coughs> business right now in this changing market with higher interest rate? Um, I mean, a lot of creative stuff. Um, a lot of networking, right? So like a lot of investors like just popped up, so to speak, um, like newer investors that have never experienced this kind of a market. Um, I mean, there's a lot of, of deals that are coming to us that people bring in. They say, look, you know, we got this. We don't know what to do with it, right? Everything that we've been doing is not working now or the, it's, it's changing or we're a little nervous about doing it the way that we've been doing it. Um, and I, I think the, I mean, really more than anything, I think the, 
the advice that I would give, right? Because Co Cordy and I do some coaching, and one of the things that we really like have been honing in on a lot is having a backup plan and then having a backup to the backup, right? So you guys know how it is. Everything is in cycles. Everything is, is just kind of rolls back and forth and over and over. We see it like you guys have been doing this a while. You see it similar cycles going through. And it's really easy to get a little bit careless when times are so good that you really like you can run off the road a little bit and you know if you can if you can hang in there for 90 days somebody will bail you out and because of student money some, being in the marketplace yeah just a, as long as you can hold it for 90 days you were good um it really can create some bad habits mm -hmm. um and i think the biggest thing right so how do you do more deals and that is make sure that any one deal doesn't prevent you from doing more deals that's right, like that's Can you really, say that again one more time? Make sure that like if you want to do more deals, and that's really, I know that's a weird answer to your question, but the thing that I'm doing so that I can do a lot of deals is I'm being extremely cautious now so that I don't have a good or a bad deal that the opportunity cost is so great it keeps me from doing a lot of future deals, right? And if you're in a position where one bad deal could knock you out of the game, Remember, if you don't remember anything else I say for the rest of the night, remember this. The good deal you miss out on will never cost you as much money as the bad deal that you do. Say that again. The good deal that you missed out on will never, ever, ever cost you as much as the bad deal that you do. Be cautious. Be careful. But within the parameters that you set and with the network that you use and, and lean on, hit the gas, but cautiously, right? The, the road's not as wide open as it was. It's not as straight as it was, and the sun's setting a little bit for m most of the visualization on what's coming, right? It's dark. So let's we speak to what's well. coming. So because, you know, for sake of time, and if you want to say something. I just want to say, when he says be extremely careful, I just have an example that came to the top of my head. Where you know someone had some rental properties and the whole COVID thing came and his tenants didn't make their next two payments and he called me he's like well we, I need help I said dude it's only been two payments you should have some money sitting aside just never mind COVID for anything that comes up there's got to be some money he didn't have it he was taking all his money to try and figure out what his next deal was going to be yeah. and not prepared for a problem in the current deal that he's working so let me talk to you guys about can, anyone know can, what OPM stands for can I throw in one thing so. Yeah. One, one other thing, cautious, right? That's, don't confuse that with scared. You don't have to be scared, but be cautious. Yeah. What does OPM stand for? Other people's, money. other people's money. So as someone who consistently does deals with 100% OPM, other people's money, so these private money from everyday individuals in my sphere or with creative financing, either with the seller or the existing financing place, does not mean I don't have money in the bank. And I think a lot of people confuse low to no money down deals with um, it being synonymous with being broke. When I did my first ever um, creative deals, I bought a small portfolio of creative deals from these, this investor in Hammond. I ended up having to sell them because I bought beyond my reserves because I bought them with inherited tenants. So I was excited that the, the, the landlord agreed. I bought them subject to the existing loan and uh, I wholesaled one of them, kept the other two, and then what it ended up happening was the inherited tenants ended up being problematic. Who would have thought? Um, and so then I remember it was like 900 and something dollars I paid to Hancock Whitney. It was two properties on one loan. And I remember because I personally paid for them because my business did not have the reserves for when the one tenant eventually got evicted and then this one I didn't renew. So because I didn't have the reserves for the underlying payments, whose pocket did it come out of? The Bank of Courtney, right? And not my LLC, not my, you know. And then the other thing was it deferred maintenance. So when they had a plumbing leak, who would, where did that money come from? The Bank of Courtney. Hip National. So, yeah, Hip National. So, all right. So the reality here, though, is as I've, one of the biggest things that I did is I actually sold a deal um, that was very, very profitable, probably one of my best deals to date. And I looked at Bob and I said, Bob, we need to do whatever we need to do. To, instead of 1031 exchanging that money and there being no taxes that way, I need that money to stay in the bank 
Because if I'm going to use my skill sets to buy properties consistently um, with creative financing through, you know, seller financing, subject to whatever, I need to be able to have money in the bank so I don't, I can go buy a, in volume but not bypass my reserves. So one of the number one things I was thinking about was my debt service reserves, right? So I said conservancy, conservatively, I'm working towards six months of payments for each property. Um, you may recommend better. You may say, hey, I recommend something else. And then the other thing is capital reserves is gonna depend on each property. If it's a fully renovated property, that's one thing, but if it's a you know, 1950s property, it's another. So the reality there, in preparing to buy frequently, one of my biggest preparations was my reserves because you can only handle so much. And it's going to be the person, as they said, I think it's Buffett who said this, but maybe someone else said it, and he just quoted them, which is when the tide goes out, when the going gets tough, is the, the concept, we're gonna see who was swimming without their trunks on. In regards, when times get tough, it's harder to rent a property, uh, repairs, maybe insurance is going up, we're gonna see who has reserves in the bank or who's been using all of their money to buy the next property. This is the power of OPM and the power of reserves, which that goes back to if you don't treat your business, your real estate at like a business, Someone who does will buy it from you. Anyone else? Does the Bank of Courtney have free ATMs? Because Heritage Bank does. It's just a shameless plug. <laughs> <laughs> free ATMs nationwide. That's all I'm saying. Give me a call. All right, go ahead. I mean, I've seen right here. So, like, if I, I don't have an account, I I, if I don't have an account there, I can just go to the free ATM. No, 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 no. No, no. So, so no ATM fees nationwide. Okay. okay. I mean, I can. Ex, that was brilliant timing. Ten on, ten out of ten on the execution of that um, punchline. Well, some final thoughts. What are you preparing for? And you know, with the, what do you see coming down the pipeline? And is there anything that you're recommending people prepare for? If, if I'm sitting in this room, I would try and prepare myself to buy. I hate to be negative, but I think down the road, people have overbought. People have bought like just meeting the debt to income requirements. And all of a sudden you have these costs going up, not just your housing, your flood insurance, your regular insurance, all that stuff's going up, plus your everyday living is going up. I don't know how many people are going to be able to maintain their house where they were so close to a house they probably overbought, you know, especially when they come in paying more than what the house appraised for. And now, down the road, I mean, the average mortgage, I think, is kept for six years. And then down the road, if they have to sell because they got to move or whatever may come up, they're going to have to take a loss. So if I'm a flipper, I'm thinking I need to get my stuff in order to be ready to buy, you know, and that, that would so be. So it sounds like some short sale skill sets. What are some yeah. skill sets needed there? Short sales? I just spent the weekend hanging out with a guy who does short sales who's been routinely doing them for the last 12 years, okay, the short sales. Um, so that's where you negotiate with the bank when they owe more than what it's worth. Um, my very first purchase was a short sale, so baptism by fire, right? Ooh, um, came in strong. So. <laughs> Here's another one. I, uh, I actually just read this statistic. It's 80% of uh, the current mortgages are under 4% interest rate. 80%? So 80% of the current loans. That was something that uh, I recently read. Uh, so what's another thing that you could prepare for? Adam, I'm teeing you up for that. Creative deals. <laughs> Where that underlying loan um, is a currency. It's something valuable in the property, right? Yeah, I mean, that's one of the big ones. So <clears throat> I, I want to throw out something just as a as to piggyback what you said, right? So it, not just time to buy, but time to control, right? And one of the, the beautiful things that I love about the way that we do a lot of our stuff is there's a lot of really great deals that I'll control for the next. We're doing one right now. We're going to control it for the next 10 years. It's a $300,000 house. We're taking over the note at $1,600 a month, doing zero interest, single pay on the extra, which is $80,000 um, that this lady wanted for her equity. And we've got 10 years to float it. And so, so basically, you're buying it subject to, but then for her equity of $80,000, it's going to be a one-time future payment. Because you said a lot of mumbo jumbo, I'm just translating. <laughs> so, so like that's one of the deals that we're doing. And, and because we were able to come in and be creative, we're gonna, we're, essentially we're gonna lease it from her for what her payment is and her balance on her note is 160,000 at like 3.89% or something like that. 
Um, and we can come in and take over that note. We can long-term rent it, which is a viable option. Not a great one, but it's viable, um, which is actually one of our backups. But our goal is to Airbnb it. And on a $1,600 payment, as long as I can do that for the next however many years, at some point, that house is going to be worth a half a million dollars, and it's going to be in between now and the next 10 years. I just have to figure out a way to control it where I'm not paying out of pocket. Like, that's the game that I'm going to play it. At lease options, subject twos, I mean, straight seller financing, a combination of all of those, which we can there was room on the whiteboard, we could have a lot of fun. <laughs> but, but really just controlling property in a way that you can afford to keep it for the next number of years. I don't think it's going to get too crazy for long, right? There's still a housing shortage, and, and it's totally different than it was in 08, right? This is not the same market shift. There's some overlap, but it's totally different. I think interest rates are going to go up a couple more times. But this one is worse. <clears throat> I don't think so. Because, see, here's the thing for the housing. There's still a housing shortage, right? So I think rents will stay fairly strong, right? The inflated side of the rents is coming down, right? There's a correction there. But I don't think we're going to see those values drop way down. And I think we'll see certain segments of houses that lose value, right? But I don't think we're looking at a crash in real estate. Well, quick, uh, let's look around here. Who thinks... Interest rates are going to go up in the next three to six months. Raise your hand. Can I raise both hands? <laughs> okay. Uh, who thinks interest rates are going to go down in the next three to six months? Not a single hand is raised. There's got to be one person that's like, I'm going to be that guy. Just because. Yeah. Just I'm in case. I'm a contrarian. Lindsay, like, I'm a contrarian. Six months now, come back. You're like, uh, remember that time? I was that guy. <laughs> so then, okay, so here's the other one. Who thinks this is going to be like 08? Raise your hand. No one thinks that this is... So fun fact, I've been, so I go to conferences a lot because I want to learn. This is my first changing market. You want to know what most people, I just spent two weeks ago um, and a whole bunch of, a, it, was an econ, it wasn't even a real estate event, it was an economic event. Um, the majority of the macroeconomic um, economists in the room were talking, like if you guys have ever heard of like George Gammon, uh, Danielle Dina, uh, DiMartina Booth, uh, who used to work at the Fed, like some of these people, Jim Rickards, what they said was they were comparing it to 1970s and 1940s, not 2008. So one of the biggest things I'm trying to do is not just stay in real estate echo chambers where everyone's like, oh, oh, wait, the housing crash. No, no, no. Most people say, no, it's not really that because the interest rates of, we've already matched the interest rates of 08. Now what most people are looking at is we're actually more aligned with the 70s and the 40s, but we have some differences like the national debt is not the same or like, um, you know, right back in the 70s, they had just taken us off the gold standard. So there's some things that are different, right? All right, I don't want to keep us going here. Any, let's go through any final thoughts here because you didn't get to answer. Yeah, the final thought with preparing for what's to come, I think um, one, one of them is, is concentrate on your income, right? I think although there's going to be a lot of opportunity uh, coming in the next two, two years, um, sometimes we, we get a little crazy, we buy a few properties, and we think we don't need that, that W-2 that we have. And I'm pretty sure Robert can, can attest to that. I'd like to, to see some of it, yeah. yeah Not all, but it. some of it. Um, I think now is the time to, to prepare your income, so therefore you can take advantage of the opportunities that are going to come about. All right, so um, we're going to give away these two books. We're just about done here. What's the best way for people to connect with you or reach out to you if you're, they're interested in working, doing some business with you? Robert, you want to start? Oh, yeah. Um, I'll give you my cell phone number. You can, Heritage Bank. Uh, yeah, my card's right over there. Just grab my card. Um, I'll answer my phone Monday through Friday. I usually fall asleep around 10. So after 10 o'clock, I won't answer my phone. But I will answer it before. I know life is busy. So if you need to call after hours, I've got someone that's supposed to call me tonight. I don't know what time, but to do an application over the phone. Because, I mean, you guys, everyone's working as much as they can to get by. So if you need to call me, you know, if I can answer my phone, I will. You can uh, Instagram us. I'm not, I'm not a social media person, my, my partner is. But Instagram is, what is it? Vertical Capital. Okay. She so, said what is it? <laughs> so it's, like at, <laughs> it's at Vertical Capital. Uh, we do sponsor the West Bank. Um, 
Rio, which is this Thursday. Yeah, this uh, Thursday. We're, we're there uh, every month on Thursdays. You can always reach us there. I have some business cards in my back pocket. You can, um, you can reach out to Elridge as well. Um, our website is www.verticalcapitalus.com. Um, and uh, our personal cell phone numbers are on our business cards. Uh, we always want to be able to talk to you, so uh, if you have a question, uh, feel free. We'll, we're more than happy to answer that question. <clears throat> um, that look made me very nervous. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we're I, wrapping I, up here, brother, and you looked at me like, well, I'm going to get just, away with this one. I'm the oddball again. I, I'm happy to give you my cell phone number. It's 601 606 7209. 601-606-7209. Um, I will go ahead and warn you, I am extremely slow when it comes to respect. Just and, I'm like, not going to make a Mississippi joke here. Well, just to give you an idea, like, and, and I the just want to prepare that. you. So if you reach out to me, shoot me a text message. <clears throat> I will do my best to respond in a very timely manner. Um, and it may be that I loop somebody else in from the office, depending on what's going on. But, I mean, I have 77 unread text messages, eight voicemails, 184 emails, and I have no idea how much social media stuff. Okay. And I'm constantly responding. So it just, I get a little behind, so be patient. Um, while, we're, but, while we're thinking of this, you guys, we want to hand out two books because I know we're in overtime right now. Um, do you guys have a question or something you guys want to ask the audience and the person who answers it? Uh, let me give them this. I feel like I did one giveaway. What's you want me to come up with it? I can come up with it. It's a question to ask the audience and the person who answers it can get a free book. Yeah, come up with the question. All right. Uh, I said the lowest interest rate that I had seen. Raise your hand and tell me if you remember it. 1.7. 1. 1. 1. What would you say? 1.75. I said 1.75. It was 1.75. All right. Lauren, you've got a lot of these books. I know. Um, all right. Oh, dang it, i got to start again now. Um, you have one? No, I don't have one. I have somebody in the audience I'd like to have a book, even if I have to go buy one and give it to them. It, well, I think, that, it's, I mean, that's, that's I think it's the youngest person in this audience. What, are you in high school still? She's in high school and she's at this yeah, meeting. She needs to have a book. That's awesome. Um, now, who's the oldest? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Uh, all right. This. Yeah. Uh, you know what? I had I had a, a duplex a long time ago. I had a very bad experience, and it kind of yeah, it kind of turned me off. I really had no idea what I was doing, and I, to be honest with you, I thought I was way too nice. I was in the process of buying it. Everything was done. I actually went to the tenants that lived there and said, "Look, I'm buying this next week." I'm only going up like 25, 30 bucks on each side because I want this long term. I'm not doing anything. You know what I mean? And uh, after I bought it, I went back to the house. They were gone. I was like, okay. I mean, it was like 25, 30 bucks. Well, evidently, the guy that sold it to me took his tenants with him. And I was like, oh, okay. Now I know how this works. And then I had to get tenants quick, and it went downhill from there. <laughs> wow. All right. Um, so this is a really really good book by the way who moved my who moved my cheese is talking about pivoting Brian you had a question yeah I'd like to ask Robert and, and, and also Adam, in this world of creative financing and subject to what's, what's the bank's attitude about subject to do you, do you understand what a subject to is That's the I think work that needs to be done no 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 subject to is um, you're not supposed to talk to bankers about this Brian don't worry <laughs> <laughs> Brian, Brian, it'll stay here. It's similar to the assumption, but not an assumption. Somebody lock the doors. So, so, so an assumption loan. I'm gonna ask Brian to leave. Go ahead. Yeah, he's over gonna ask Brian. To leave. So, a subject to is whenever you buy a property, and the title transfers, but the loan is not paid off. The loan is then staying with the seller, and the buyer is making the payments on the loan. Yeah, they might have a problem. So, <laughs> so the bank might. So one of the biggest things is in the actual clause, it says that they have the right but not the obligation to call the loan due. So some may say, absolutely, we were, you know, the loan, we were basically, uh, we were due payment among transfer of title. So that's actually one of the number one things with creative finance and we talk about, if you do not practice safe financing, you will get screwed in the bad way, right? So they call a loan deal, and you're like, oh, I got, 
I bought this loan subject to, it's worth 200, but the loan was 225. And then the bank says, hey, I saw that the, you know, whatever point they were triggered, they call the loan due saying 225 is due, but it's only worth 200. You can have some issues there. So one of the number one things that Adam's father and some of the gray haired guys has taught me about creative financing is that safe financing makes all the difference. A historic uh, story they told me is that if there was two houses built by the same exact builder, finished on the same exact day, same exact specs, everything, right next door to each other, which one? Um, one of them would be, if one thing makes one of them more valuable than the other, and what is that? Um, terms. terms. So for example, they're same price, same everything, but this one's 200,000, let's just say with 8% with a one year balloon, but this one's 8%, <coughs> With, or maybe it could be 9% with you know, 30 year financing. It depends, right? Those terms would matter. So one of the biggest things here is you wanna be careful of things like, I wouldn't want a portfolio full of subject to loans. Why? Because I don't want a portfolio full of potentially unsafe financing. That's why I don't encourage people to overpay with creative financing and I don't encourage people to buy with balloons. So understand with subject to, there's a good way to do it and a bad way to do it. Um, does that answer your question, Brian? Okay. Sure. Sure. I, I want to throw one thing in there. So <clears throat> we, we have done and still do quite a few sub twos. Um, but here's what you have to, like, here's my answer, right? How unfat, does everybody remember where they were in, like, January, February of 2000? Get, get vaguely, right, give or take, and kind of remember like what was going on, right, when the world was still normal. Could you have ever fathomed that the world would be shut down in 60 days? No. Nobody could. You're talking 2020? Yeah, like yeah. the beginning of 2020. I thought I heard 20,000. I was like, you're doing a Y2K thing here? <laughs> that's a different speech. That's, a, that's an answer to a different question. Um, but no, if you're like 2020, right? January, the world will be shut down in 60 days and it is unfathomable that that could happen. Eight months ago, interest rates were? Three to yeah, four. Good, good. Right? Yeah. That thumbs up good. But what, three or four percent? If you went back and asked you six months ago and said, hey, listen, this is a rumor going around that interest rates are about to be at eight percent and going up. Right? It's almost unfathomable until it happens. So it, is it unreasonable to think that it could happen where there is a switch pulled and sub twos aren't a thing anymore? Or a particular bank says they're not a thing for us anymore. <laughs> like it's, we're in that period of time where you've really got to be prepared for the unfathomable things. Um, I still do some sub twos, <laughs> but there, there's backup plans. And like, and as part of my revert around like that, like we, we're starting to do a lot of recorded lease options for long term. Right. Just go back to don't, don't be, be cautious, but not scared. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, you know, so if, you, if, if you go back to Courtney's example, where the loan is for 225 and the house is worth 200, you got the loan at 225 and you can go to the new guy and say, baby, but he's not paying you. And so now you've, you've triggered a mechanism where you were getting your $1,600 a month, and all of a sudden it comes to a stop and the bank owns a house that they got a $225,000 loan that's no longer good, and they can maybe sell it for 175 dollars because the bank can't sell it for market rate. I, I, I'm so it's, correct me if I'm no, wrong, <laughs> but here's what I've learned. You can, now, smaller banks smaller will bank make will more that. sense. Larger banks will do that. Larger banks don't operate under the same normal small business sound principles right. that you do because it's a shareholder game. Right. And it, they, the stuff that they do, we could never do in our business because it's a totally different game. Yeah. Right. So ultimately here, I want to continue to be a huge advocate for safe financing. Um, sounds like I'm teaching, you know, sex ed up in here, but it's the reality <laughs> of is use yeah. protection. <laughs> <laughs> Bring out the banana. Um, so the reality here is, is that at the end of the day, a huge part to that. 
your terms, your backup plans, and a backup plan to your backup plan. The reality here is there's a lot of people, there's a lot of bad, Adam said some are bad habits that have been in the marketplace. So understanding what you're getting into, and uh, one of the number one things, like I hang out around what I respectfully call the gray-haired guys, because I want to learn from guys, what were you doing in the 70s, in the 80s, where interest rate went to? Well, you talked about the average being 7 point something percent. I'm like, that 21% in the 80s didn't help, you know, <laughs> that average, right? Uh, so reality here is you want to make sure that whatever you're doing, that you understand if there's some consequences, right? For example, if you're, there were some consequences coming to overpaying. There's some consequences coming to, um, you know, if you're dependent on short-term um, rental income, but then there's an ordinance that comes in and shuts that down. So no matter what you're doing here, if you don't have backup plans to backup plans, you know, which means equity, reserves, multiple exit strategies, all these things, you can be in for some hurting. And my phone's been ringing off the hook with investors who are hurting. And sadly, I think that there's some more pain and suffering down the pipeline. So the question here is, how can you both play offense and defense? A huge part of that is how can you play both offense and defense with your financing? Yeah, you can get some great subject to deals, but how can you, that's offense going and acquiring, but how can you play defense? Go look at the underlying loan. If you guys don't know subject two, go to Courtney10k.com. And I sat up here and did over an hour long training on subject twos here. Um, a lot of you guys were in the room when I taught on it. And a huge part of that is you need to make sure you know what you're coming in, you know, you're taking over. You need to make sure you have some equity in case somehow a due on sale clause is triggered and that loan is accelerated, right? If you don't have that, that's when you're up a creek without a paddle. Would it be fair to say that it's, uh, you know, the time for the speculator downslope, the, the time for the long-term investor fund that's going to hold yeah. that, that opportunity? Most flippers I know. I mean, um, is that fair, fair to say in this coming environment? Most, uh, most flippers I know are either sitting on the sideline or um, they're real puckered up with what they currently have. <laughs> so the reality there is short-term stuff, flips, things like that. Um, if they don't have multiple exit <clears throat> strategies, you're absolutely right. Uh, this is when the long, let me say this, a lot of the, the experienced investors that I know who've kind of been doing deals a little bit here and there the last few years, they're starting to come out the woodworks and they're starting to say, my time to play. So one of my last tips here is any tips for, you know, how to take advantage of the next three to six months is you need to have your team have multiple people to give you multiple options. These are three different, actually technically four options here. If you include, uh, you know, private money lenders from people within your sphere of influence. But the reality here is the other part is your skill set. So if your skill set, if you're like, hey, I'm only used to using, you know, uh, short-term loans. Short-term loans are probably one of the top things I, um, I'm, I'm hearing some people who are like, hey, I did a, a really short three-month loan. So the fact that you guys are, you know, expanding your, I, I like to hear that because that's, time is what's not on people's side right now. Um, yesterday, um, one of the things I said was uh, that if you're financing, if time is your enemy with your financing, that's not safe financing. Time needs to be your friend. It really does. Meaning, be careful with short balloons, short-term balloons, meaning, you know, all the payments are due, you know, at this certain time frame. Be careful with those. Have some backup plans. So, uh, all right, who, um, dang it, I freaking hate this question. Like, having to figure out how to give these out last time. All right, um, who, actually, you three guys are in town. One of you guys... Any one of you guys have read this book yet that you're like, you read it yet? Uh, you have not? I'll give it to you. You guys all read it. Okay, if you don't go to your hotel room today, you're like, you're going to your turn. Next okay. All right, you read the next one. You read a paragraph. All right, guys, look. Um, all right, guys, I want to give you some time. We're definitely into overtime. It's like the freaking LSU game right here. Um, so with that being said, guys, thank you so much for coming up. Can we give them a round of applause? Um, and then, if any of you guys, um, who here is going to go with us to Chimes? Anyone going to Chimes? Bob, can you stand up? Bob, um, are you going to be heading over there pretty soon? Yeah, i got to pack up the table. But so he's going to pack up the table and head to Chimes. Go look for Bob. Turn around so everyone knows what you look like. <laughs> if you look for a man with a, like long hair, that's not Bob. Bob. <laughs> <laughs>
All right, guys, so for those of you who are joining us, we're going to have a great time at Chimes Talk and Chop, even if you only stay for 15, 20 minutes. Um, but otherwise, thank you guys for coming. Next month, the potluck, you'll have a chance to sign up for some food on our Facebook page. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.